started a series last week called It's Messy. It's Messy. And we pretty much came to the conclusion, if you missed it last week, let me catch you up. Let me just go ahead and say this. Life is messy. There you go. That was last week's sermon. People were like, why couldn't you just say it that quick last week? Uh, yeah, I don't know. Uh, life is messy. Well, life, we would love to uh, hope that life would always be this continual trajectory of up and over. It's always just a better day. Every day is better than the last. Well, sometimes I've had pretty stinky days. And sometimes we just know that there are seasons that are really hard. Life is messy. Life is messy. Now, as you, as you, as you go through life, you've probably been a part of a, of a few pretty messy moments, right? There's been some things that you've done that's just, that's just incredibly messy. Let's get practical. Maybe, let me show you a few pictures, and you might be able to identify with this kind of mess. The, the first kind of mess is that. Is it, can you identify with that kind of mess? Like that, you got your desk? Anybody? Like, you thrive in that. Anybody? Like, somebody cleans it up, you wouldn't know where anything is at. Gosh. Okay. Let's get let, the next one. So, it, you got kids, you understand this kind of mess. It's like, they're so joyful, and it's such such a disaster. Well, maybe, maybe you're like, that's horrible. Well, imagine this parent. Go to the next one. That's a mess. You ever had kids? Oh, that's nasty. Or if you've uh, lived in Lufkin very long, you understand the catastrophe, the messiness catastrophe of a couple of years ago. Anybody drive through that one? Man, life is messy. Life is messy. Um, one of the messiest moments that I've, I, I've ever had is my very first job was I worked at fast food. You might with me, like some, some good old fast food. And we had these um, big grease vats because it was all deep fried, baby. Um, and, and so at the end of every night, we had to clean the grease. There was these hooks that went in. One sucked the grease out, cleaned it. One put it back in. I missed a crucial step. I missed the hook that you put into where the grease goes back in, and I had it set on the side, and I went off to go clean, and I came back, and the entire vat of grease had been pumped out of the tank here and all over the floor here, everywhere. And it's been a few minutes, so you know how grease gets if you've cooked any, it begins to harden all over the floor. It took literally... Now, when I say that, it's not just like figure of speech. Literally, me and two other employees all night long to clean up the grease. They uh, started off, my friends ended up, I don't think they were uh, anymore. That was about the messy. Now, fast forward to about a month ago, I did the exact same thing with a new washer that we got. I, for, I hooked everything up. I forgot the little drain. And so I am in the bathroom and all of a sudden, water is flooding the house. And um, let's just say, it was messy. It was messy. Every towel in the house. We've all been through some messy, some messy things. But if I were to think about life just in general and, 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 and the whole of life and the daily of life, what is the messiest thing that I can imagine? And I think there's one thing that wins head and shoulders above everything else. It's the messiest of all. It's the interconnectedness and it's the interaction with people <laughs> people because people are messy people are messy you know how i know that because you're messy <laughs> and i'm messy aka what's the messiest thing you can do in life relationships it's hard it's messy they they, they are can be difficult and they can be unpredictable <sighs> but that's the that's really though what makes up life, isn't it? It's a combination of relationships that we have, so it's hard to miss the mess because we're always surrounded by messy people. And here's the big conundrum. Here, here's the big problem, it seems. The messiest part of life can also be the greatest part of life. And if we try to skip out on the mess, we'll also skip out on life itself, relationships. And so what we've done so often, if you're like me, you've been hurt before, you've, you, you've had people hurt your feelings, you, you've had maybe some real deep wounds before, so what we do is we build up some walls around us, keep everybody at a pretty good distance, 
Um, and, and so they can't get very close. And so what we're left with is a lot of people, even the closest relationships that you have, don't go much deeper than a couple levels below the surface. You never actually talk about how you're feeling or how things are going because we don't learn how to do relationships very well because we try to miss the mess, right? I just don't think there's a good way to, to do that. So what's the answer? Where can we find the answer? Well, I, I started last week. We're looking at Luke chapter 6 and breaking down a sermon by Jesus. He's a pretty good preacher, so we're going to look at him. Uh, it's called the Sermon on the Plain. He's got just uh, tons of people all around him that have come to be healed and to, to be changed and be touched by Jesus. And he takes this as a teaching moment. And as he's teaching through, uh, I'm going to summarize the entire sermon part that, uh, of Luke chapter 6 here in four words. And then we're going to go back and break these down. Four things that Jesus says. Here it is. Here's what he says to do. What do you do with relationships? What do you do when life gets messy? Four words, love, do good, bless, and pray. That's what Jesus says to do. Love, do good, bless, and pray. So pause how you doing in relationships as it comes to how Jesus says to do them. Love, do good, bless, and pray. Me, I'm like, ah, yeah, I'm okay. It's fine. I mean, I kind of, I love, you know, I mean, I would say 62% of people, right? Like, I'm doing pretty good. Like, how are we doing? What, what's, your, what's, what, what, what's your grade there? Now, let's read. Luke chapter 6, 27 through 28 says, but you who are willing to listen, that's a big one right there. I say, love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who hurt you. Now look at the object of the sentence. My, my, my kids learn about sentence structure and the direct object of a sentence. Look at the objects. <sighs> Enemies, those who hate you, those who curse you, and those who hurt you. Love, do good, bless, and pray. So let me ask the same question again. How you doing? I dropped a couple letter grades, I'm telling you. I think I'm failing right now. I gotta retake the test. How are, we, how are we doing now? I mean, this is a different kind of teaching. This is a difficult task. This isn't an easy thing. And here's what we can learn from that. Because what do we do with the mess of relationships? Well, as it comes to following after God, let me just give you a slight news flash. Jesus never invites you into avoiding a mess. He just invites you to walk with him through it. And so this is not helping us to avoid the mess of relationships at all. He's just showing us the best way to do relationships. And here's what's interesting. Um, his, his teaching on how to treat people is drastic. And we think it's drastic for us. Love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who who hurt you. Like, that seems extreme. But imagine the readers, right? Because even though the, this scripture is for us, it wasn't necessarily to us. It was to the crowd around them. Um, and they're mostly Jewish people who in this time was, was not some figurative statement, literally was, was subjected to the power of Rome. Rome had come in and totally taken over every facet of their society and culture. They can't do anything without a Roman soldier being there next to them. Literally, they're looked down on and they're hated by. Now, I know you've been hated on, right? There's a difference between getting hated on because they didn't like your pants or whatever. By the way, I mean, I tried to risk something today. We'll talk about it later. Um, and then being hated by they were literally hated by and taught down to and shunned by and seen as a different class of people by these Romans. And so as they're surrounded by this culture where these Roman guards are telling them everything to do and they're being hated, Jesus says, I want you to bless those who curse you. I want you to love those who hate you. Imagine how much more of a difficult task this would be for them than even it is for us. Now, Jesus didn't make a mistake. He didn't say something wrong. He's very articulate, and he's very purposeful in the things that he says. He says it on purpose. Now, here's what I find interesting. Jesus 
doesn't teach us and doesn't instruct us on how we interact with people, how we treat people, how we live in the context of others. He doesn't tell us to begin with the people that we're the closest to and then go out from there. We, here's how you love your closest and then everyone from there gets a little worse. No, his baseline for connection is how you treat those that you don't like and that don't like you and the relationships grow from there. We think, I'll love the ones closest to me and I'll go from there and you may get some scraps. But Jesus says, no, 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 we start with those that are the furthest and we like the least and then everything grows from there. His baseline for connection is how we treat those that we like the least and like us the least. That's a pretty heavy dose, pretty heavy-handed teaching right there. Loving those that you'd rather hate. We've met those before? I have. Caring for those that you'd rather dismiss. All of, all of our other relational capacity to do anything as we connect with others in life, Jesus says, should come from this place. Now, what I find challenging as I even look at my own life and I think about people in general, what I find challenging is so often we don't even treat people that we're the closest to as good as Jesus says to treat the ones that we're furthest from. And that's just me, okay. Jesus begins, the, in the next few verses, he breaks down kind of what this looks like. Like this lived out. And he begins to use... Uh, something called hyperbole. Anybody remember this? Hyperbole. And so he uses kind of an extreme idea to illustrate a deeper point. Here's hyperbole. So, um, you know, you're talking to your kids and they don't listen. You said, I've told you this a thousand times. Now, you've probably told them a hundred times, but a thousand times. It's much bigger and extreme idea because you're trying to get the point across that they don't listen. I slept like a rock last night, right? You didn't really do that. Hyperbole. I have a million things to do. No, you have three, okay? And you're just easily stressed out. But I've got a million things. Hyperbole. And so as we go through this, I want you to understand as we read through, this isn't necessarily a prescription of how we're supposed to act exactly to the letter in every single situation. But Jesus is illustrating the attitude of what it looks like to live in this way and how we treat people in very extreme situations. Are you ready for the instruction? Yeah, I don't like it either. Here we go. Verse 29, he said, if someone slaps you on one cheek, punch them in their eye. No, offer the other, that's what I would love to do, offer the other cheek also. What? If someone demands your coat, Offer your shirt also. Give to anyone who asks. And when things are taken away from you, don't try to get them back. Okay, so maybe Jesus, right? You're just trying to, it's just, you're just talking, right? Now, obviously, this isn't every situation. There are some situations you break into my house, you're not going to just have free reign to hurt my kids and steal my stuff. You're going to meet my good friends Smith and Wesson, right? I mean, they're going to be there to greet you. But, this is the default place of which we should live as we interact with everybody. He begins to illustrate what it looks like in, a, in an extreme and practical way. Slaps you on the cheek, right? Can you imagine that? Now, in this culture, it wasn't just a painful moment where somebody slaps you. It was one of the most insulting things that could be done to you. It, for somebody to look down on you and to demean you and to slap you on the cheek and on the face in front of other people would be disrespectful to the extreme. It's insulting and humiliating. I don't know how you act when you're humiliated and you feel insulted, um, but mine's not usually like God honoring in that moment. And here's my problem. My definition of what insults me is pretty loose. Um, so just the other day, I'm literally prepping for this sermon and I get tested. That's the bad thing about preaching. You're tested, I think, more in the things that you're preaching on. And I would love to say I pass the test every time, but we'll go there later. We're in this lane, and the sign is there, two lanes, merge left. Two lanes, merge left. I'm in the left. Somebody is far behind me to the right. I'm driving normal speed. They all of a sudden, 
hit up to like 80 to get around me as the lane has come down to one. And I am angry if I've even got to put my foot toward the brake. You know what I'm talking about? I may not even had to hit it, but like my foot moved off the gas and now you're dead to me. <laughs> Nobody else. That sign was a thousand feet back. You couldn't have just pulled in behind me. Like that's how, that's my reaction. It's not like turn the other cheek, oh, pass me again. But, but, the, but this place that God says we should treat people from, this, this base and default of love, that's, that's, that's extreme. What does this point to though? I think this can really point to this idea that relationships are risky. Sometimes we can get hurt. Sometimes we can, we can feel insulted, humiliated, demeaned. Sometimes relationships don't work out well. Sometimes we have bad days in relationships. Right? Relationships can be risky, but Jesus is saying, take the risk. Like relationships are worth it. He says, if someone takes your coat, don't withhold your shirt. Now to us, that's bad enough. Like you're standing there shirtless in the middle of Walmart because they stole your coat, right? But in this context, shirt actually means tunic. Tunic, because they would have a coat and then they have a long, we were watching uh, the other day, uh, the show called Chosen. Anybody watched The Chosen yet? So good, you gotta watch it. And then my daughter was like, why are they wearing a dress? Right, well, because like they, they weren't wearing a dress, it's a tunic, even all the guys, it would be this long thing down to your legs, looks a little dressish, that's the tunic. So you're not just standing there without like a shirt, you're standing there in your skibbies, hoping that you wore underwear that day because you gave them the coat and everything else. That's extreme, that's extreme. That's not comfortable because relationships take effort that often is uncomfortable it's uneasy, it's hard, but we gotta make the effort because it's worth it. He said, give and don't ask for it back. Give and don't ask for it back. I'm, I'm not too good at that one. Relationships have a cost. There's a cost associated with living in a relationship and connected to other people. There just is. But it's a cost that's worth it. It's a cost that's worth it. Now, again, to go back, God is not calling for us to be abused, overlooked, and to be doormats in life, okay? But he's illustrating a point of the default place that we should come from as we treat people. It's to love, it's to do good, it's to bless, and it's to pray. That's a high order. And as we live that out, it looks extreme. It looks a whole lot different than the way life looks on the norm. But that's also the point because relationships are risky. We gotta take the risk. Relationships take effort. Sometimes they're hard, it's uneasy, it's uncomfortable. We gotta make the effort in relationships that have a cost to them. But Jesus says it's worth the cost. It's all about the attitude with which we treat people. We default to this first. We go here first. Is this usually our default though? Usually somewhere about six months down the line, we try to find some resemblance of care and love. But default in the moment is planning and conspiring. How can I do something to them and get away with it where nobody finds out? Nobody else? I can just let the air out of their tires. I won't slash it, but I just want them to be inconvenienced. I mean, this is where our mind goes. How can I get back, have vengeance on someone who hurt me? And Jesus says, the default place is actually, how can I care for someone, do good to someone, bless them and pray for them? Not just your closest, it's everyone. Now, nowadays, everything, everything, everything. If I believe that that, that bar S hot dogs are the best, which they're not, they're the grossest, but, and you believe that ballpark Frank hot dogs are the best. The fact that we disagreed, we now can't be friends. The fact that we disagreed is the most polarizing thing in life, and we set our camps up in social media campaigns about how you're an idiot and bar S is the best. 
Everything's polarizing nowadays. Everything is insulting and everything is hate-filled. Our culture thrives on conflict and contention. Everything, literally everything. Listen, I'm not trying to walk into a hotbed here, but you're not my enemy if you decide to get a shot or not. I don't hate you. Hey, let's have, let's have things that we stand up for and believe in. But everything shouldn't be polarizing. It's like we look for reasons to hate people. And can I say this? The church has not been notorious for being any different. You disagree with me, all of a sudden, you're my enemy. When Jesus said, I'm actually looking out for my enemy and looking for ways to care for them and love them. It's a different way to live. Everything doesn't have to be so polarizing. It's like our default way is how can I, how can I reject people and, and harm people and hurt people and talk bad about people? And let's choose, you choose the hot topic of the day. But I don't think there's ever been a better time for the Jesus sermon than right now, a call to say, hey, we're supposed to be people who love and do good and bless and pray. Let's get some bracelets. Tattoo it right here if you want to. You got permission from your pastor. Okay, let's get t-shirts. Love, do good, bless, and pray. Jordan, write a song next week. We're going to sing it, okay? It's, it's, it's on you. Love, do good, bless, and pray. That's the default that we got to come from, and Jesus sums up the entire thought in this next verse. Verse 31, he says, and you're going to know it because we've all heard it. He says, do to others as you would like them to do to you. What's it called? Everybody together? The golden rule, right? The golden rule. Did, did you know that Jesus is actually repackaging a thought and an idea that everyone else already knew and putting a spin on it? Almost every culture, almost every religion has something that is similar to the golden rule. Everyone you look at. From Islam to Judaism, Hinduism, almost every culture has something that reflects the golden rule. Here's the unique thing. Jesus took what people are already saying, and he took his Jesus spin. You know what I'm talking about? The Jesus spin, where, where Jesus takes a thought, and he flips it on its head and makes it a whole lot different because everything else is pretty much put in a negative form. And we can hear, I'm going to tell you one of the ones in Judaism that was passed down, that was taught. It says... That which you hate yourself, don't do to others. Hey, if you hate it and you don't like it, hey, that thing, don't do it to other people. Well, Jesus flips it to a positive and he says, that thing which you like, actively go do that. That's a whole lot different way to say, so here's it is in context. Again, face punching. It's easy to say, I don't want to be punched in the face. So therefore, I won't punch in the face. It's harder to say, I really want an ice cream, so I'm going to bring you a sundae. That's a different kind of way to live. It's actively seeking out to initiate good. How are we doing? Letter grade. Yeah, don't look at my score. Don't look at my report card right now. Jesus is calling us not to reciprocate, but to initiate. Not to just reciprocate and do back to others, whether it's good or bad to us, but to be people who initiate to do good. Seek after good, no matter who they are. Jesus is saying, I want you, hey, do this, do this. That person that you hate and you've been spewing against and you don't like, whether they're in your house or not, whether they're the distance from you, whether they have a platform behind the podium that says a seal of a country on it, or they live in your house. Here's, 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 here's what you do. You flip the script and you say to yourself, if I were to change places with them, how would I want to be treated? And then, here you go. It's so weird, crazy. Do that. That's a mic and I'm just gonna walk away. That, that's what he's saying. Now, easier said than done and regardless of who they are. Jesus is speaking specifically to people that we hate, that hate us, that we don't like, because he's saying, start there, and everything grows from that place. He goes on and says, if you love only those who love you, why do you get any credit for that? He said, even sinners love those who love them. That, that word sinners, let's, let's just admit we're all sinners. 
Like we've all messed up, but the sinners, he, he's, it's this idea of people who don't, don't have any desire to seek after the good of what God wants, right? Even, sin, even people who don't want to do good and right, they even love those that love them. And if you do good only to those who do good to you, why do you get any credit for that? Even sinners do that much. And if you lend money only to those who can repay you, why would you get credit for that? Even sinners will lend to, the, to other sinners for a full return. See, the baseline isn't how we treat our best. The baseline for life is how you treat your worst. I'm not going to ask the how you doing question again because I'm getting less and less confident in me. I'm sure you're doing great. The reality is, can we admit, I'll admit, the reality is the majority of our relationships, even our closest ones, are pretty self-centered. Pretty selfish. Because he's saying like, hey, if you just do because it's been done to you, you give to get, the worst of the worst do that. There's no credit there. But think about even your closest relationships. Most of the time we give to get, we'll bless if they did something for us, but it's a quid pro quo kind of situation. But how often do we just initiate and give to give and love to love and bless to bless? How, how much different would our marriages look if we just said, I, I'm gonna be the one to initiate, not because they did this or they did that or they earned it or anything. I'm gonna love to love and give to give and bless to bless and pray to pray. I, it's just gonna, it's gonna be my default place to come from. What happens if we don't live this way? What happens if we don't live in such a way that even the worst gets treated this way? What happens? You ever heard of that idea, like the bad apple spoils the bunch? Like, it's true, you, you have like a rotten fruit in with the rest, and it's going to spread to the rest and ruin it. You want to you attack the bad first, remove it out so the rest can stay, can stay good. And here's what's happened so often in life. We've allowed unhealthy and, and, and bad relationships to wound us, to hurt us. And we walk around with all this undealt with, not knowing how to deal with people who are hard to deal with. How to love people who are unlovable. And we walk around with wounds and we walk around with resentment and we walk around with spite. And that spite seeps into every other relationship you've got. Those wounds begin to wound other people. You begin to become the person that you don't even like. You hurt other people. The bitterness seeps out. And before long, if we don't deal with the baseline of the worst first and how I deal with those people, then the effects of that relationship affect even the best relationships in my life. And it will destroy and demean and diminish even the closest people in your life. I've seen it all the time. I've seen it in my own life. And what we do is then we become closed off and we isolate. And even our closest people don't know how we're feeling, how we're doing, because we've closed ourselves off. See, Jesus doesn't give us an easier way, right? It's messy as we deal with people, like just understand, you're gonna go to work tomorrow, you're gonna see people, it's gonna be messy. You're gonna go home and you're married and you've got two or three kids, it's messy. You've got one kid, it's messy. You got no kids, it's messy. You go to Walmart and you shop, it's messy. Everywhere, if you're on people, it's messy. He doesn't give us an easier way, but he does give us a much better way. It's a much better way to live. But he never said it was easy. He said, love your enemies in verse 35. Do good to them. Lend to them without expecting to be repaid. Then your reward from heaven will be very great, and you will truly be acting as children of the Most High. For he's kind to those who are unthankful and wicked. You must be compassionate just as your father is compassionate. <sighs> What's the reward then for going through this effort and getting messy in relationships and caring for people who we'd rather dismiss and loving people that we'd rather hate? You got any of those people in your life? What's, what's the reward? Jesus said, it's great. He didn't tell us. Like, Jesus, I want something specific, bro. I want to know there's some crowns waiting for me. 
I want a check monthly of at least $1,200 deposited into this account. Like, there's got to be some good reward in order for me to act this way. Jesus said, it's a great reward. It's a great reward. Jordan, if you can join me up here. It's not just a great reward in heaven, right? Because one day, come on, heaven's going to be good. We're going to party in heaven. Like, in heaven, I'm going to be good at golf. Because on earth, I wasn't gifted. I really enjoy going out there, but I, 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 I'm just really bad. In heaven, things are going to be perfect. But it doesn't just say, hey, we're not going to be rewarded in heaven, but we're going to be rewarded from heaven. There's a difference. On earth, from heaven, there's going to be a reward. And, and play this situation out. You're a little kid, right? You're, uh, there, there's no worries in life. And you're, you're, you're walking down the mall. And in the mall, there used to be this candy store. Remember the candy store? Everything's closing in there now, but there used to be a candy store. And you walk by the candy store, and the owner of the candy store comes up to you and says, hey, I can't leave the store, but can you do me a favor? Can you take this down to this other store? I need you to deliver this for me. And when you come back, I've got a reward for you. Well, we make an assumption that our reward's gonna be pretty sweet, right? Because at this person's disposal is a lot of candy. They're in charge of it. Their resource is candy. Now, if you've got a father in heaven that says he owns everything, that has unlimited resources, and he says, if you live in this way, your reward's gonna be great, I think that we can assume our reward is gonna be pretty sweet. That if the God of the universe says your reward's great, it's worth getting messy over. It's worth seeing people in a different way way. See, relationships are risky. Relationships can be hard. What we do by default is that the first sign of any difficulty we run, from the closest relationships that we have when it gets hard, we run. From the furthest away relationships, whenever somebody disagree with us, we run, we attack, we belittle. But Jesus called us to a different way. And here's the deal. You'll never You'll never realize the great reward unless you step into the risk. Unless you risk living the way Jesus says, we'll never reap the reward that he has. There's just a better way to live. What if we came from a deep fault place of whenever I meet people, when I see people, whenever I react and respond to people, like I come from a place of love and doing good and blessing them and praying for them. Come on, that's a better way to live. Then what's the result? It's not vindication. That's what we want though, right? Somebody hurts me, I want them to hurt. I want them to suffer pain. Well, you know what Jesus says? He's like, hey, vengeance is mine. Let me do that. Let me handle it. You're probably thinking people in our, in our lives right now that have hurt us, relationships that have went sour. I remember thinking, I just want to give them a sliver back of what they did to me. And that's not a, that's not a place that we can live from. And here, the healthiest place that we can ever do is to forgive someone and place that into God's hands. The result's not vindication, but it's transformation. He said, if you act this way, you're becoming more and more and more like God. And that's the goal, he said, be holy as I am holy. Romans 12, two says, don't conform to the pattern of the world. Very little, the research is done, very little sadly distinguishes the church from everybody else. Look at whatever stat you want. And the church and the people of God should be different. And we should be an example to other people. Not just to see how people respond, but the lives that we live because of it. He says, don't conform to the pattern of the world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. L let how you think about how you treat people transform the person that you are. See, he didn't love you, newsflash, because you're lovable. <laughs> God loved you way before you ever had the capacity to love back. He died for us before we ever muttered any words to choose him. When you were on your worst day, he loved you the most. And that just blows me away. I think of the things that I've done in my life that um, would, would make anyone blush. And in that moment, God loved me no less than he loved me right now. It's not a re reciprocating kind of love. That's what he calls us to. Here's your good news. For those who aren't too affectionate, 
This kind of love is, is, the, is, is the word agape. It doesn't mean it's an affectionate feeling. It doesn't mean somebody hurts you and run up to you and be like, oh, you just, you look so good. No, 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 no. It's a caring and it's a compassion. It's a selfless kind of love that lays down how I feel. And it's a kind of love that can only give what's God. Because it's, it's the only time this word is used in association with a godly kind of love. And this is a place that we can only give what we've gotten. And some people in here, I think the reality is we've never come to a place that we can be healthy in relationships because you've never understood the love that God has for you. And he was talking about that early. And you're never gonna be able to step into a healthy relationship unless you first realize that your God in heaven loves you. Would you stand up with me? Like there is a love that is so big and it's so crazy and it's so wild that even the greatest philosophers wouldn't be able to write on and explain this kind of love. And it's that, it's that love that God pours out on you. And it's not because you were good. It's not because you did anything to earn it. God just said, I love you. And it's poured out on you. And it's only whenever you find yourself in that love, it's only whenever you've accepted the love of God. And sometimes we gotta just take a pause moment. Sometimes we gotta take a moment just to say, God, I just need to feel your love because you'll never be able to respond to people in a loving way without receiving the love of God. Do good. How about we just do good to people? Bless, what does that mean? Speak favorably. Don't blast, but bless. Use your words for good. I mean, sometimes we don't even treat our, our close people this way. How am I using my words? And don't just pray about people, right? We're good at praying about people. Let's pray for people. Every person, like them or not, they're a person that God desires and loves and longs for. And what if you're the only person in this entire world praying for them? What if you're the only person that Paul's and said, God, I pray that you would just bless them and use them. And you're like, I'm not praying for them. Then if we can't pray for them, we have to ask that God search our own soul because we have some mess we need to deal with. Which good news, that's next week. Come back, dealing with your own mess. And would you close your eyes? Father, I know that this is not one of those sermons that makes us just feel like running through a wall and so excited this is one of those most needed ones that, that we can ever hear though God because if we go through life there's no way to avoid people and we're actually not called to but you tell us how to treat people whether it's people that we like or people that we don't people that love us or people that hate us God help us to be people who love and do good and bless and pray. Before we send that text, God, before we make that post, before we say those things, before we respond in that way, God, help us to ask, is this loving? Is it doing good? Is it blessing? And how can I pray? God, help us in this, because we can only do it through you and through your Holy Spirit. It's not easy, but it's the best way. As your heads are bowed, if you're in this place and maybe you just say, Pastor, can you pray for me? I, I've just, I have some relational wounds and hurt and I just need God to come in and heal. Would you lift your hand up? There's some people in this place. Come on, I know it. Come on, it's hard. It's hard. But only God can bring that healing. I just wanna pray for you. Now, maybe you're in this place and you're like, Pastor, I'm just gonna admit you're talking about all this stuff and Jesus says to live in this way, but I don't even know Christ as my savior. I, 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 I'm not sure, I'm not confident that I would go to heaven today if this was the end of everything. If I died, that that would be my home. I'm just not sure of that. Well, here's the good thing. Jesus loves you and all you've gotta do is respond to him. He's done everything that it takes for you to be a part of his family and be forgiven of everything that you've ever done. And if that's you and you say, I just need Christ in my life, I need to live for him, would you slip your hand up? And I wanna pray for you. Awesome, thank you, thank you. 
as I pray, I just want you to pray. And maybe in this moment, you're going to pray for somebody who's hurt you. This is hard. It's a challenge. Here's our challenge. I want you to pray for somebody maybe that's hurt you. I want you to pray for maybe some wounds. I think so often our own healing is on the other side of releasing something to God. And maybe as we pray, I also want you to, in this moment, if you raise your hand, you need to give your life to God. Would you just say, God, forgive me of my sin. I give my life to you. In a moment, your life has changed. It may not seem magical, and it's not. It's spiritual. You're changed. You're made new. Father, right now, in the name of Jesus, God, I just pray for everyone in here. God, relationships are hard. They're messy. It's not easy. But God, you've called us to wade through it, and you're going to walk with us in it. God, help us. God, heal some wounds on the inside of people who have left us hurt. Maybe we've been walking around, maybe we've been hurting other people, and we've been allowing this bitterness to spill over into every area of our life, and we've become isolated and closed off, and God, there's no way to live. God, let us be people who default to love and to doing good and to blessing and to praying. And God, so there's some people right now that we're praying for. And it's so hard to even utter words that are positive in somebody's direction. But God, I just pray that you're releasing something in our own spirit as we choose to do that. Thank you for what you're doing and thank you for the life change that's happening. We lift you up and I praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Come on, can we just give God glory?